Welcome to our Grandparents' Day celebration. I'm Dr. Han, and I'm the lower school principal here at Atlanta Classical. We hope that all of you are safe and doing well in the aftermath of Hurricane Helene. Although we would have loved to be in here with you in person two weeks ago, we hope that you will enjoy this version of Grandparents' Day in the comfort of your home. At Atlanta Class School, we believe that we are heirs and stewards of the Western tradition. And we know that tradition is the thread that connects us to our past. It grounds us in the truths that shape us for generations. We believe that learning from that tradition and honoring our heritage is essential to forming knowledgeable, virtuous citizens. And you, our grandparents, embody the spirit. You are the storytellers, the keepers of wisdom, and the champions of family history. Grandparents' Day at Atlanta Class School provides us with this opportunity to acknowledge and to celebrate the vital role that grandparents play in upholding the traditions that enrich our lives and our community. We want you to know that you play such a crucial role in passing down the traditions that shape us, and we are so grateful that we can partner with you in teaching our next generation the invaluable lessons, the lessons of love, the lessons about the importance of community, and perhaps most importantly, the lessons that shape the moral and intellectual virtues of our children and our grandchildren. This morning, your grandchildren, alongside their teachers, said the Atlanta Classical Pledge, which is, I will learn the true, I will do the good, and I will love the beautiful. And they will say this every morning that they are here at this school, because nothing is more important than for your grandchildren to be characterized by truth, goodness, and beauty. Thank you so much for joining us today and being a part of this great work. Now I'd like to introduce Mr. Franklin and his eighth grade choir who will be performing Song of the River arranged by Mark Patterson. Yeah. 
what a fantastic job by the eighth grade choir. And now I would like to introduce Ms. Ham and her second grade class who will be performing Bed in Summer by Robert Louis Stevenson, followed by the preamble to the United States Constitution. Thank you to Miss Ham and her second graders for a wonderful recitation of Robert Louis Stevenson and of the preamble. That was delightful to hear from them. Good morning to ACA grandparents. Uh, we're excited to welcome you to this year's Grandparents Day ceremony. Grandparents Day each year gives us an opportunity to put our principles into action. And as a classical school, we hold to uh, many principles that we feel set our education and our school culture apart as distinct. At this ceremony, I want to really briefly set out two of the principles, two which are connected really to each other, but also to you, two of these uh, principles that make us distinct as a classical school. Uh, the first is that we believe that our role as a classical school is to recover and preserve and honor and ultimately to pass on a tradition. We think that that is a necessary function of a school that is acting as a robust institution, is to look back at the tradition that we are inheriting and to find a way to give that to our students and that we would instill in them a, a sense of reverence and respect for this tradition that is formative of their civilization. And this, therefore, connects to our second principle that I want to talk about today, which is that we respect the wisdom of the past. These two things absolutely go together. We can't instill a tradition without students having that respect for the wisdom that has come before. We know that, as Faulkner said, the past isn't dead. It isn't even past. It is present with uh, us today as we, uh, as we live out our principles, and as we constitute the next iteration of our civilization, the wisdom of those who, is, who have gone before and who are with us now is still present in the present. And so we need to access this wisdom, and we need to access these features of our tradition. And this is something that we want to teach our students to do. We hope to enact uh, these two principles, particularly in our curriculum and also generally in our culture. So in our curriculum, we have chosen the greatest works that, uh, that characterize Western civilization. Not all of them, we don't have time to teach all of them, but anything that we select, we want to be of the highest class from our civilization so that we are endearing our students to our great tradition and initiating them in the great conversation that has formed it. Uh, and we also, in just the culture of our school, want to be talking about this tradition and the past in a way that is, is dignifying it, that's giving it honor, and that students would go forward from here uh, with a certain orientation toward the past. Uh, we think that this orientation toward our tradition and, and towards, toward the past and its wisdom is an essential outcome of an ACA education. 
um, the ACA student and the ACA graduate will, will not see the past as something to, to deconstruct, as something to reject, and, but rather as something to integrate into their lives, into the present, such that the wisdom of those who have gone before will drive their own action and, and their own virtue and their own principles. Uh, this happens, as I say, through our curriculum. This happens through our culture. But ultimately, this must happen and be proven out in relationship. And this is where you come in. Uh, our students need you, grandparents, to, with courage and with honesty and with perseverance, to take a powerful role in their lives. Uh, we can go so far in the classroom, but we need you to be uh, living representations of our tradition and of the wisdom that, that you have as, as those in a different generation than our students. And we hope that you assert that strongly and that you uh, form incredibly strong relationships with our students that we hope we are also preparing them to invest in well and with, and with virtue. Uh, I'm excited every year to talk on Grandparents Day because I get to talk about the way in which I live out these two principles even in my own personal life. Uh, every day at my house, as I say each year, and Grandparents Day is Grandparents Day because three years ago, my wife and I bought a home with my mother-in-law and my father-in-law, my wife's parents. And now Mimi and Pop Pop are two of the most important people in the lives of my four children. Uh, Mimi and I often come home at a similar time from work uh, and I know whether or not she's home by whether or not her car is in the driveway when I, when I get there. And if it is not there, then I know that when I walk in the door, I will hear my children call out, Mimi, and run around the corner only to see me. And their, their slight disappointment that then turns into some excitement is, is uh, sometimes disappointing to me, but on the whole it is exciting because I know the strength of their connection to their grandmother and that she is a living manifestation of wisdom that I am not even prepared to be for them. And I am so, so uh, excited about the connection that my children have to her and what she can be to them in her love and virtue. I know that if I do see her car and I walk in, I will see her playing with them and see them looking at her with reverence and awe and deep love. I hope that you know this look from your grandchildren, and I hope that you feel newly assured and excited to assert yourself powerfully and with love in their lives uh, so that you can work with us in conveying a tradition and with, and with passing on wisdom to our students. Thank you for doing that. And I hope this is a great Grandparents Day for you in this form. And now coming up, you guys will get to hear from our head of school, Mr. Andrew. Good morning, grandparents. It is such a joy to be able to speak to all of you, even if only virtually. Uh, we consider it our greatest privilege and honor to work with your grandkids. Uh, we think of this educational project not merely as preparation for work. It's not about simply making a kid a competitive member of a global economy. It is furnishing them with things that will sustain and nourish them for the rest of their adult lives, well beyond their careers. We aim to give them a love of things that are true, a love of things that are good, and a love of things that are beautiful. I'm grateful to Dr. Hahn and Mr. Sheps for their comments this morning, uh, along with our second graders for their recitation of the preamble, and then our middle schoolers for their beautiful song. Uh, just earlier last week, we had uh, occasion to host our annual senior thesis dinner at ACA. This is one of the high points of the academic year for me personally. Uh, it sets up this project for our seniors, which culminates in a 12 to 20 page paper that they have written uh, and ends in the spring with them defending that paper in a 50 minute Q&A with a panel of faculty members, all who have read it and prepared a series of questions. So this project begins, we tell our students, with a question. 
something that unsettled them, something that they encountered in the curriculum that, that perhaps kept them up that night and that they had sort of more questions and, and interest in it that they wanted to pursue, perhaps over the course of an entire year through this, through this project. So at this dinner, uh, in this beautiful wicker basket, you would find uh, a book uh, that had been given as a gift to every single one of our seniors. It is wrapped, and inside the book there is a handwritten letter from one of the teachers announcing that they will be their advisor uh, and that they have chosen this book specifically for them to help guide them through this project. I focus on this because I want to communicate something about the culture of ACA, and that is that we love stories. Uh, it's a thing that animates us. It's, it's one of the gifts of an education to have, uh, at the end of a time at ACA, a bookshelf six feet tall full of text that you've read in your time at our school. Interestingly, I woke up the next morning after the senior thesis dinner and I had a barrage of emails in my inbox from parents who had read an article from The Atlantic published the day before uh, that described the state of elite universities across our country where professors are encountering young people who have never read a book in their entire lives. The story focused on Columbia University, which has a very famous great books program, and a professor who was just uh, confused and dismayed to encounter graduate after graduate arriving at Columbia, ill-prepared to read even a single text like the Iliad from start to finish. And we're dismayed at, at the state of things, but we should know that it's not accidental. Uh, the National Council for the Teachers of English just a couple years ago uh, issued a new guideline to states who were forming their English language art standards and said that books should be decentered in an English curriculum and they should be replaced instead by things like media studies. So that our high school graduates have not read stories is, is not something that we should be surprised by. And I'm grateful to be at a place where families have chosen something different. In fact, people are choosing Atlanta Craft Classical in great number. We have over 2,000 students currently on our waiting list hoping to be admitted to a place where every freshman, no matter what, is going to read all of the Iliad, all of the Aeneid, where every senior is going to write a senior thesis paper. Uh, it's a different kind of project. And I want to thank all of you in part for this reality because I think your children are choosing this education for their own children because of the standard that you all have set. So truly, from my heart, I'm grateful to you all, the grandparents, for the principles that you've established in your own homes. That I am here at Atlanta Classical is largely because of the work of my own grandfather, Neil Andrew, for whom my oldest son is named, uh, who was a principal for four decades in New Hampshire, uh, starting in the 1950s. He met my grandmother in a one-room schoolhouse in northern New Hampshire in the 1930s uh, and began this beautiful life and instilled in me a great love of education and, and wanting to build schools that provide incredible opportunities for young people. Something my grandfather used to always tell me was that whatever I was, be a good one. And when I first heard that, I always thought he was sort of recommending that I pursue excellence in every initiative. And I think that was true. But as I grew older, I sort of discovered the moral imperative embedded in that command. Be good. No matter what you are, no matter what you do with your life, pursue virtue, pursue goodness. We think that an education is not a morally neutral endeavor. We believe that students are changed by the stories that they read, by the ideas that they encounter, by the people from whom they learn. And so this work is dangerous. My own mother told me once that the books that you read and the people with whom you read them will determine the direction and the quality of your life. And this has become a sort of animating principle for my own work at Atlanta Classical Academy. At ACA, we have a single vision for your grandkids, one mission. We want to form them into knowledgeable and virtuous citizens. And, and I'll end with this, saying a brief note about each of those components. We begin with knowledge because we think that every graduate of our school ought to know certain things about their world. I think that the poverty of public discourse that we encounter in our present political reality is largely due to the fact that people cannot have first principles conversations. They get caught up in, in superficial conflict because they don't share a common educational foundation. They don't know the same things. They haven't read the same sources. They have not, for instance, read the Constitution in full. 
they don't have the preamble memorized. And so when, when moments of conflict come up, they are incapable of debate because they're working from different foundations. They do not share a common vocabulary. And so part of our work at ACA is furnishing our students with the stories, the ideas that gave birth, that gave life to the tradition and the country that they now inherit. We begin with knowledge and we have a 13 year curriculum that begins in kindergarten, culminates in 12th grade, that spirals on itself. And so they encounter something like the American Revolution, for instance, three, four, and even five times by the time they graduate from high school. So knowledge is, is our first purpose, but then virtue is the second one. Knowledge is not good on its own. It is only through virtue that knowledge is perfected and becomes wisdom. We think that knowledge without virtue just makes you dangerous. And so we set out in front of our students these standards of human excellence, our seven core virtues at Atlanta Classical toward which all of our work is oriented. Again, it gives us a shared vocabulary that allows us to have the most important conversations together. Finally, after knowledge and virtue, we aim to produce in our students citizens. I was speaking to a gentleman the other day and his first question about our school was whether or not our students still said the Pledge of Allegiance. And I was sort of disoriented by this because since 2014, since our founding at ACA, Every student on our campus has said the pledge every morning. But what he was getting at was this sort of new orientation toward one's country that he had encountered. He was meeting young person after young person who was refusing to pledge their allegiance to anything. Instead, they demand that institutions pledge allegiance to them. And there is this heart of service, this, this heart of sort of offering oneself to one's country that has been lost. And so citizenship begins to crumble. There's this really interesting book um, by a gentleman who works at the American Enterprise Institute uh, named Yuval Levine called A Time to Build. Uh, and he writes this about the state of institutions in our country. And I wanna share this with all of you. He says, rather than contain and shape individuals, our institutions seem to display them, to give them prominence and gain them notice without stamping them with a particular character, a distinct set of obligations or responsibilities, or an ethic that comes with constraints. Such institutions prove unworthy of our trust, not so much because they fail to earn it, as because they appear to not seek or even desire it at all. We have moved, roughly speaking, from thinking of institutions as molds of character to seeing them as platforms that allow people to display themselves to a wider world. So think then about the state of our nation, to become a nation of performers instead of a nation of citizens. Suddenly we understand why the, the state of, of political discourse can best be understood by just watching political commercials. We are ceasing to give ourselves to something, to be changed by that nation. So there's a question, how do you get out of this? How do you rebuild a country even? And, and I would actually say it begins with knowledge. It begins then with, with virtue after, after knowledge. But the final thing, after you have equipped a person with knowledge and you have given them virtue, the final thing is love. Can you raise up a new generation of American citizens that love something? The British writer G.K. Chesterton in, in 1908 was reflecting on this, this uh, neighborhood in London called Pimlico that had fallen into something like despair. They, they, were, they were sort of uh, destroying themselves from the inside. It became sort of an eyesore in, in all of London. And he posed this open question about how you fix Pimlico, how you restore it, how you, how you improve it. And I want to end with, with this beautiful quotation from, from Chesterton. He says, the only way out of this mess is for someone to love Pimlico, to love it with a transcendental tie. If there arose a man who loved Pimlico, then Pimlico would rise in ivory towers and golden pinnacles. If men loved Pimlico as mothers love their children, arbitrarily because it is theirs, Pimlico in a year or two might be fairer than Florence. Some readers will say that this is mere fantasy. 
And I answer that this is the actual story of civilization. It is how cities grow great. Go back to the darkest roots of civilization and you will find them knotted around some sacred stone or encircling some sacred well. People first paid honor to a spot and afterwards gained glory for it. Men did not love Rome because she was great. She was great because they loved her. Our work at Atlanta Classical is not about criticizing or deconstructing or simply fussing about our present reality. It is about preparing the next generation of young people to build institutions, to build families, to build cities, to build schools, where people are in pursuit of truth and goodness and beauty together. Thank you again for joining us. It is our delight to work with your grandkids and to partner with all of you in this. We look forward to seeing you next year at our Grandparents' Day celebration. Thank you.